Morning church, it's so good to be with you guys this morning. I'm just reminded that today is the day that the Lord has made, so let's what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I'm super stoked to um, welcome everyone here from Yamba, uh, from our Tweed location as well. It's so good. If you guys don't know who I am, my name is Eli, and alongside my beautiful wife, Georgia, we are the youth directors here at the Tweed region, and we get to serve our amazing students every single Friday, which is just such a blessing. I have a couple of announcements just to go through before we get into the service. And the first one is that today is a day that we start our prayer and fasting, which is really exciting because it lines up with what we're going through in Ephesians 3. Um, And I want you guys just to be so eager and so stirred as God has more for all of us, not for just the pastor, not just for the leaders, but even for you. So I pray that you guys would just seek the, the face of God this week and just be really encouraged that He has something for you. The other cool thing is that we actually have prayer meetings happening at 7 a.m. And yes, I said 7 a.m. It's super early. But even for those people who sleep in, we have one at 7 p.m. as well at both locations, Tweed and Yamba. So come join us as we seek the face of God. And um, just as I step into the offering message, man, I just want to thank all of us and honor all, all of you guys who literally give into the house. We've been seeing some amazing things happen just because of you guys' generosity and um, obedience to God. I would love for you guys to pray and believe with us as we're believing for a uh, youth director down in our Yamba location. Uh, I believe that as we, as we catch the students, it will then catch schools. And then as we catch schools, it will then catch families. And this has been happening at the Twee region. We've been seeing a mini revival happen. And if that doesn't stir your faith or ready to give, man, I don't know what will. But we've been seeing a mini, mini um, revival happen at the Twee location where we've been seeing students come to the altar, literally weeping, asking for God's forgiveness. We've been seeing them restored. We've been seeing them see salvations in their families. And yes, I did say families. We've been seeing students literally take home the impact that God has had on their life here on a Friday night and impact their homes for them to then bring their families on, uh, not on Fridays, on Sundays, which is so cool. So I want to encourage you guys as as we um, finish off the offering message is that God has something in store for everyone. Honestly, everyone not just for you students that are impacting them, their families, but for all of us. So I want to honour all of us who are giving into the house and we're just going to pray and then go into our worship. So Heavenly Father, we give you this day. We give you this time. and We just be still right now, Father, as we recognise you and as we put our focus on you, Jesus. Um, we just pray as we, we speak into the offering, Lord, that you would do what only you can do with it. And Father, we just pray for this week as we... Um, dive deeper into you and as we seek the face of you, Jesus, we just pray that you would have something in store for all of us, that you have more in store for all of us, Father, and we lift you up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
promises never fail Your promises never fail No No, no No, they never fail No, no, no No, they never fail No, you never Cause you never fail Oh, you never fail Oh, cause it's not who you are Oh, you never fail You never fail No, you never fail Oh, you never fail You never fail, no, no. Oh, you never fail, no, 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 no. Oh, you never fail. Let your faith rise, let your faith rise. Oh, you never fail. Oh, he's never gonna fail, you no, no, no. Oh, you never fail. Stands will come
Well, hello everyone. It is so good to be with you today and we are going to continue through the book of Ephesians. Today we are in Ephesians chapter 3, which is loaded with so much goodness and revelation and language. I believe that is going to draw us into the heart of God. And uh, I'm really, really excited that we are also today starting our seven days of prayer and fasting. And I can hear everyone cheering there in Yamba um, and also in Tweed. But I do, I want to encourage us to get involved in this week of prayer and fasting because something happens in us. The goal of fasting ultimately is to increase our appetite for God. You know, often you would hear it said, hey, if you need breakthrough in your life, whether it be financial or relationally or in your health, then, then fast and believe for that breakthrough. And it sometimes can feel like with fasting, we're, we're trying to twist God's arm into giving us what we want or what we need. But I believe fasting is so much deeper and so much more beautiful than that. And that's what I want to press into. You know, when we grow in the revelation that we are children of God and as children of God, we get God. And we talked about that in week one, that we have every spiritual blessing in Him. We get God. When we understand that, I believe our hunger and our desire for Him grows. And fasting is a way to increase our appetite for more of Him because He's the goal. He's the prize. He's the treasure. And honestly, every time I fast, I am so surprised every single time. It shocks me how quickly I satisfy every desire I have in my life. Uh, if I'm hungry, I quickly get food. If I'm uh, bored, I, I quickly click on social media. If I'm tired, I go grab a coffee. Every desire, you'd be, you'll be shocked to know how, how much you fill your desires. But when you fast and there's those desires for those things that you usually have, and you remember, hey, I'm intentionally going without to increase my appetite for God, it's incredible how much your appetite does grow for Him when you realize, man, I suppress so much of my desires for Him through satisfying those desires through other means. But I honestly believe we are in a season in history in the church where God is raising up His sons and daughters who are after the more of Him. After the more of God, we're not satisfied with where we've been. We understand we're actually born for more, born for more of Him and what He wants to do in us and through us. There are people, I believe, that God is raising up who are after the better portion. You know, like David would say in Psalm 27, 4, where he would say, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all, my, all the days of my life to gaze upon on the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This is why we're fasting. It's to seek him. It's to inquire of him. It's to gaze upon him. And I believe fast tracking, uh, sorry, fasting fast tracks our ability to have that desire like David. It sharpens us spiritually. It quickens us to be attentive and to hear his voice and to know his voice. And ultimately the reason why we chose this week, February 21, uh, is because it lines up with Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to focus in today on verses 14 through to 23. We're actually going to talk about the whole chapter. But um, verses 14 to 23 is Paul praying for spiritual strength. And that's why we're lining up the fast to line up with the prayer of spiritual strength is so that we would focus in and understand that, that fasting is about st spiritual strength. And, you know, there are some amazing verses that we love in the Bible. Ephesians 3.20 would probably be one of those ones that gets quoted a lot. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. The reason it is a favourite scripture, I believe, is because it shows that God is wanting to do more and he's able to do more than all we can ask or think. But it's according to the power at work in us. It's not just about changing our circumstances. We love to take scriptures out of context. It's about understanding that there is a power at work within us. I want to ask the question, do you want the more of God? I think about that question, I'm like, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want the more of God? I'm not sure about you, but when I think about all that God has done in my life, honestly, I want to scream for joy. I, I get so excited. I feel like you know, David in the Old Testament where he danced naked before the Lord. I'm one of those people. I'm like, come on. I get so excited when I think about how he saved me from my sin, 
the sin that was going to separate me from him for eternity. He has saved us. When you dwell upon that, when you dwell upon the fact that I'm freed from these sinful addictions and these destructive habits, I'm filled with his spirit so that he can produce his fruit in my life. The fruit of love and joy and peace, kindness, um, patience, self-control, these kinds of things. And this is what happens when we fast. I, I believe we fast track the work of God that he wants to do in us because we grow our appetite. Now, there's a few different fasts that you can do. You can do a food fast where you completely fast food and you just have water or you just have liquids. You can do the Daniel fast, which is fruit and vegetables and water. You go without those delicacies of sugar or meat or all those things that you want to satisfy desire with. You know, this one's, I believe, pretty sad, but it's real in this day and age, social media fast. Um, I say it's sad because you think we should be able to go without just clicking on a screen, but we find it hard. It's an addiction. And so to actually make a decision to go without something, I know this is real. And when I fast, I fast uh, all food. I just do water and I fully get off social media because those things are so addictive in my life. And uh, I, I want to be hungry for God. So I encourage you, we're going to email out some information of uh, what fasting is, how to fast properly. Um, but I want to say this, Fasting without prayer is dieting. So make sure that this is a week of intentional prayer. And that's why we're going to have 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. prayer meetings in our church buildings in Tweed and in Yamba. So I'm excited. Make sure you make a decision to get on board. But today we're going to focus in on Ephesians chapter 3. And it says this in verse 14. This is Paul's prayer for spiritual strength. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. For this reason, you know, when it comes to certain, I'm not going to go any further right now, because when it comes to certain words and statements and phrasings in the Bible, you've got to take notice of it. So when Paul says, for this reason, you've got to ask yourself a question, for what reason? Why is Paul saying, for this reason, he's implying he's talked about something already. In Ephesians, the, the verses before this, in Ephesians 3 verses 1 through to 13, you'll see that Paul is talking about the mystery that has now been revealed. What is this mystery? This is what Paul is so ecstatic about talking about, the mystery. Well, he says in Ephesians 3 verse 6, he says, this mystery is that the Gentiles, that's everyone who's not Jewish, so that's probably the majority of us, the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We are included in the family of God as sons and daughters of God. The mystery is the church. The church now being made up of all people, all uh, tribes, all nations. The fact that God is now available to all men was a mystery. You see, in the Old Testament of the the Bible, the, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets who were prophesying about the things in the future and the things that God was revealing to them, They didn't see everything perfectly. They saw in part. And they never prophesied about the church. They never saw this mystery that was hidden in the heart of God. They saw the Christ. They saw him being killed for the sin of the people. They saw him reigning for eternity, but they never saw the church, the church that would be made up of all people, not just the nation of Israel. Why couldn't they see it? Because it was a mystery. God kept these things hidden. So the fact that we as Gentiles would be grafted into the family of God was a complete mystery to the Jews. They were not expecting it. They were not wanting it. You might be sitting there thinking, get over yourself, Israel. Get over yourself, Jews. But this was a big deal because for thousands of years, it was God and Israel. It was God and the Jews. And that's why when people read the Old Testament and they see God in their talking and dealing with the people of Israel and talking about going and um, taking land that is not theirs, the promised land, and uh, wiping out the nations, the people that live there, and people are like, well, I don't like God. I don't like this angry God that I see in the Old Testament. And they try and comprehend it, not understanding that this was God's original covenant to the people of Israel, is that they were the chosen people 
that he would bring his plan of salvation to the world through. He would reveal himself through this nation. But then you come to the New Testament as well and you think about Jesus and his ministry. It was actually a ministry to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. His main audience was Israel. It was Jewish people. Not even Jesus showed that the church was a plan waiting to be revealed. What is this showing? This is showing that there is more in God than we might even realize or understand. He is more gracious. He is better. He is more loving. He is incredible. But even through the ages, people didn't understand about the mystery that was going to be revealed, and that is the church. This is a mystery to to people. But there is even more to it than that. God wasn't just about to reveal something to the nation of Israel through the church. He was actually about to reveal to the heavenly realm, to the heavenly being, to angels and to demons. He was about to reveal to them something that they didn't even know about God. It goes on in chapter 3, verse 10, and says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be now might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Think about this. These angels and these, well, they all started out as angels. They then became fallen angels, those ones that fell and became demons. Uh, these, These angels who were in the throne room of God, who saw the very untainted presence of a perfect, holy God. They knew who he was. They knew how incredible he was, but they didn't know what God was about to do. They had been in the untainted presence of God's throne room. They knew exactly the majesty and the wonder of who he was. They knew how holy and perfect he was and that he couldn't be faced with sin. Yet there was about to be a mystery revealed to these heavenly beings. The mystery wasn't just going to be revealed to Israel. It was going to be revealed to all creation. What were they about to learn? It goes on in verse 11 of chapter 3 and says, This was according to the eternal purpose that he had realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God the Father always had this plan to bring about this through Christ. says this in verse 12, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Here's what they were about to learn. They were about to learn that these lowly, sinful, rebellious, broken Gentiles, that's us, who were once cut off from God, now have access to the throne room of God, to the perfect Father through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We have boldness, access, and confidence to come to the Father because of Christ. That's why the writer of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. It's because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. We can have confidence and these spiritual beings are like, oh my goodness. You know, just the other week, two weeks ago on a Sunday, I was sitting in my room before our large gathering here at Tweed, sitting in my office and I was just praying and I was preparing my heart for the day and I'm going through my message. I'm in the holy presence of God. I'm having this intimate moment with him and then all of a sudden, boom, my office door just gets thrown open and guess who walks in? My kids, my two sons, Kai and Lennox, and they walk in so confidently, confidently they're like, hey, Dad, and uh, they, they just don't care that I'm in this special intimate moment. They're just like, hey, Dad, they walk in, they sit on these two meeting chairs that I have in front of my desk and they just put their legs up over the chairs and they just start talking to me about the morning. And I sat there and as I was like frustrated for one moment, I thought, this is what we're like before God. Not that he's angry and frustrated, but we can walk in that confidently before him because of the throne room of grace that Jesus Christ has purchased for us. Not because of how good we've been, but because of how good Christ has been. And this is the gospel. And this is why this was going to reveal to these heavenly beings, these fallen angels, namely the devil and his demons, who were damned for eternity because of the sin that rose up in their heart because they saw the holiness and the perfection of God, yet they still said, we want that glory for ourselves. They had known his fullness. They had seen his glory. Therefore, when they said, I want the glory, God threw them out for eternity so that we as the church now, when we walk through our life of pain 
and suffering that is involved even in the Christian journey, but we stand up and we say, God, you are good because he's doing something in us. There is a power at work in us. It is revealing to these heavenly beings, wow, he's better than I thought he was. He's bigger than I thought. The manifold, the many facets of God are being revealed even to these angels and to these demons. It was a mysterious plan, yet God chose to reveal it. The blood of Jesus was poured out not just for Israel, but for all people. That's like when the prophet Joel prophesied some 600 years before Jesus Christ came. He, God spoke through him and said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I shall pour out my spirit on all flesh. flesh. Even as a Jewish prophet, he was probably picturing that that was all of Israel. But God was saying, no, it's greater than that. It's on every single person. So that's why Paul says in verse 14, for this reason, for this reason that the mystery has now been revealed, that God has poured out his spirit for every single person to be a son and a daughter, to come into relationship with him. For this mind-blowing reason being revealed, Paul is now praying for you and he's praying for me and he's praying for strength that as children in this new family of God, we would be able to understand and have a revelation of God's love for us. Goes on in verse 16 and says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the spirit in your inner being. That according to the riches of his glory, when we understand God's ability to strengthen us is inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. When you understand that there is unlimited power, there is unlimited resource in God, you are more likely to come to him. You know, friends, it says in the Bible that in heaven there will be no sun because it's not needed because of the glory of God. Look at this, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. And the city, talking about this this future city, this future kingdom, the city has no need of a sun or a moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the lamb, Jesus Christ being the lamb of God. (laughs) That's mind-blowing. This is the glory that we would be strengthened according to the riches of his glory. Now, I don't know about you listening, but I know that I need his strength. I need this power at work in my life. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you would probably agree that it's just not all roses. It's not all dancing through fields of lilies. Like there is difficult times. There is troubles. There is hardship. There are moments that you can feel like you're getting crushed, moments of doubt, moments of fear, moments of anxiety, moments of wondering if God's with you. It's actually in those moments that God is doing a deep work in our lives. He is building something in us. And this is why Paul prays that we would be strengthened by God, by his riches through our inner being. Why our inner being? Why not our external? Why not our outer being? Why our inner being? Because Jesus teaches us it's from inside out that our life flows. It's from inside out. So faith starts in your spirit, man, in your inner being. And faith then uh, starts and it in, in flows out from there to impact our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And when your thinking is impacted, your actions are affected. This is why we do prayer and fasting, because it strengthens our inner being. When you fast and when you pray, you learn to tap into the, the, uh, the riches of his glory, not the riches of the world, which so often we try and tap into, not the riches of ourself, but the riches of his glory. This is why Paul is praying. This is why we're focusing in on this prayer over this week, that according to the riches of his glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through spirit in your inner being. And here's why. Here's the goal of this. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. (laughs) This is awesome. The goal of being strengthened in our inner being is that Christ may dwell in us. Friends, this is the pinnacle. This is the Mount Everest of the Christian faith is that we would understand that Christ lives in us. This should make us smile. Even if we're watching this through a screen right now, we should actually be filled with joy at the revelation that Christ 
Christ Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the, the Saviour of the world, wants to live in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That Christ may dwell in you. You know that word dwell there means to take up residence. He wants to live in us. Understanding that I host God should change the way I live. And we, I believe, should evaluate our lives. We should evaluate our lives and ask this question, am I allowing space for Christ to feel welcome to reside in my life? He wants to dwell. He wants to, li- he wants to take up residence. And this blows my mind because I sit there and think, but I know some of the things I do wrong. If Christ dwells in me, what does he think of some of those things? We should evaluate our lives. We should think about those things. Because I think, how can a holy God live in me? And this is the greatest mystery to me because I'm like, if I was God, I wouldn't live in you. And I know I always say that, but it's true. If I was God, I wouldn't live in you, but yet it's not according to the riches of my glory. It's according to the riches of his glory. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. They're far above. So how do I provide a dwelling place for Christ? He goes on in verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. How do I provide a dwelling place for Christ being rooted and grounded in love? Is that me trying to stir up love to be rooted and grounded in love? How how do I be rooted and grounded in love? Well, Jesus says in John 15, 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. How do I provide a dwelling place for Christ? We provide a dwelling place for Christ by dwelling with Christ, by dwelling with Christ with him. The roots of our lives are to go deep down into Christ, into his word, in prayer, into his church. It's not just a muster up your own strength to try and be rooted and grounded in love. Try really hard. It's to abide in Christ. Bob Goff says this. He says, Jesus does not turn people into Christians. He turns them into love. When we abide in Christ, when we abide in his word, when we abide in prayer, when we abide in the revelation that there's a power at work within us, the fruit of the spirit starts to be produced. Love, joy, peace. Without abiding in Christ, we cannot produce that in our own strength. But Christ wants to dwell in us through faith, through believing in him, that we would be rooted and grounded in love. We provide a dwelling place for Christ by dwelling with Christ. It goes on in verse 18, says, Grant, rooted and granted in love, that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That we would be able to comprehend with all the saints. Friends, we need each other. We actually need each other to to try and grasp what Paul calls the unsearchable riches of Christ. We actually need each other's help to do this. A friend of mine, Nath Cartledge, who's preached on here before, he's a part of our Tweed team here, has this great analogy of when you see an apple and you actually, if you're looking at an apple, you only see one side or one angle or one facet of that apple. But when there are people on all sides of the apple Everyone's seeing a different part of that apple. It's like that with God. When we are walking out this journey, we're all on different journeys and we all at different times see different facets of God. And when we're in community and when we're dwelling in the church as the saints, as the body building one another up, we're able to tell about this side and this facet of God, of Christ, of his love that maybe someone else hasn't experienced. And Paul says it's not just about understanding with human intellect, but it's about experiencing God's love, that you would know. That word know there is actually the Greek word genosko. That that actually means to intimately experience. It's actually the word that they use for intercourse, like it's that intimate, It's, it's that connected. This is how God wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us, that we would 
intimately experience him, that we would know. He goes on and says, to know the love of Christ, you would experience him that surpasses knowledge. That word knowledge there is the Greek word gnosis, which means general intellect or general intelligence. He doesn't just want us to have knowledge about who he is. He doesn't just want us to have knowledge about his love. He wants us to know. He wants us to experience. How on earth are we actually going to know and experience and comprehend the fullness of God dwelling in us? Well, that's where he goes on in verse 20. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. If you're like me, you, you would love to try and take this scripture, take it out of context and make it about all the circumstances of life coming into alignment, having a long, happy, healthy life. But that's not what God's saying through Paul in this moment. He's saying, no, there's a power at work that is transforming us to actually understand the greatest privilege of all, and that's to know Christ. That's to experience Christ. That's to be in relationship with Him. That's to be transformed into His image. And this is the prayer that we're focusing in on this week. Over seven days, we're just going to pray through Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through to 21, that we together may know, we may know Him, intimately know Him, not just know about Him, but know Him. And today I want to ask that question, do you know Him? Have you experienced Him? Is there a deep, deep understanding through that experience of the love that He has for you, that you're a part of the mystery that has been revealed to the world, to the heavenly beings, that the love of God is greater? that His plan is greater than if you don't. I want to pray for you right now, my friend. And for the rest of us, if we know that love, I pray that there would be a revelation of the more that God wants to do in us. He wants to expand our understanding, our capacity, our experience and our knowing. So why don't we pray together right now? Lord, I thank you. Thank you for every person who's listening to this word right now. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, that it reveals to us who you are and what you're doing. God, I thank you for uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Lord, that the mystery that is revealed, that we are a part of that mystery. And God, I pray that we would tap into the riches of your glory. Lord, we would tap into understanding that you are the power that is at work in our lives. Lord, although there are circumstances and difficulties that we walk through, we can have deep confidence because we have access to your presence, to your glory, to your throne room. So Lord, we lay our lives down right now and we say, come Lord, do a greater work in us. Lord, do greater things through us. We're hungry for you, Lord. We desire more of you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Why don't we just talk through that in our home gatherings right now? Look at some of these verses and just say, what is standing out to me? And if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, then I would encourage you, pray to him. Say, God, I want to know you. I want to experience you. And you can surrender your life simply by just saying, Jesus, I give you my life today. And if you want to know more about walking with him, following him, then there are links in these videos that you can click on. We'd love to get in touch with you. We'd love to connect you into the body of believers, the church, the saints, so that together we can comprehend his love. Have an amazing week and we'll see you next week.